let's lift our hands to Jesus and turn this song into a prayer it says lo I come in the volume of the book as it is written of me someone is praying Sabela Casa Prate Belendo Coso Prest Shapa Caparato Sabra de Beleca Baladosia. He said, Destroy it not, for there is a blessing in it. Destroy it not. In Jesus mighty name we pray in Jesus mighty name we pray please let's remain standing I want to speak over someone while I pray the Lord give me a scripture Ezekiel 12 from verse 21 someone's season has come and the word of the Lord came to me saying 22 son of man what is that proverb that ye have in the land of Israel saying, the days are prolonged and every vision faileth? 23, it says, tell them therefore, thus saith the Lord God, I will make this proverb to cease and there shall be no more use of it as a proverb in Israel, but say unto them, the days are at hand and the effect of every vision. 24 it says for there shall be no more any vain vision or flattering divination within the house of Israel for I am the Lord I will speak and the word that I shall speak shall come to pass everything God has declared concerning your life in the name that is above all names I stand by the unction of the Spirit and I declare, may this be a season of speedy performance. May this be a season of speedy performance. Before your eyes, you will watch prophecy come to pass. Before your eyes, you will watch prophecy come to pass. In the name of Jesus. Are you ready for tonight? Yes, Father, my heart is opened. My heart is opened. I came to encounter grace. I came to encounter wisdom. Come on, someone is praying. I came to encounter grace. I came to encounter grace. I came to encounter wisdom. I came to encounter power. Someone pray. Shateke peke tebe laka tafaraka subes. Krata paka parata katebe leke tebaranta skiata. I came to encounter grace. I came to encounter wisdom. I came to receive redirection, a reordering of my life and destiny. Go ahead and pray. I cause the spirit of destruction. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus. Now, this is not part of my teaching, but just for a minute or two, I want you to sing for me that restore song again. You know, we've been singing that song again. When you see me repeat something again and again, it is because the Spirit of God wants to do something. God moves even through melodies. He says, I will reveal my dark sayings upon the harp. It's a song that speaks restoration. It's a song that says the years that has gone, the things that have left you, the relationships that have gone, maybe certain graces, maybe you once walked in a level and for whatever reason, your making or otherwise, God wants to speak a word right now. And I'm speaking to our global family and the body of Christ. Receive this as a prophetic word in this season. Go ahead, my dear people. Restore everything that was lost. 
has left you maybe you lost money maybe you lost relationships you lost your business you lost your loved one your marriage is falling apart your relationships torn I want you to see the God of restoration even in this song coming through for you coming through for you you will sing it as a prayer while they sing it to you as a prophecy are you ready now Restore everything, everything that was stolen. My God will restore everything, everything. Restore, you will restore, restore everything. You will restore everything that was stolen. someone it will do you like a dream but he will restore he will restore the joy of your salvation he will restore your finances he will restore your relationships ha. he will restore your ministry he will restore your business he will restore your children he will restore your laughter One final time. Father, we believe you. This is why we are here. We know that you are God and God all by yourself. It is within your power to bring your word and your speakings over us to pass. And we have come tonight believing. We have come full of faith, ready to receive. And we pray in the name of Jesus that tonight there will be the hearing of faith and a mighty working of miracles. Change someone's life. Redirect someone's destiny. Let someone encounter grace. Let someone encounter direction. Let someone be repositioned for an excelling life in the name of Jesus. If that person is you, shout a very loud amen. Hallelujah. Welcome to the house of God. Good evening, everybody. This is Koinonia. Please be seated. Reverend Akila and his lovely wife, all the way from Joss, are here worshiping with us. Please give them a big, big God bless you. This does not look like Koinonia. Welcome. Give them a big, big hand clap. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma. In the name of Jesus. Now, one or two very important announcements, and then we'll get to the word in the name of Jesus. Next week's our miracle service for the month of February. You're clapping like you do not want anyone healed, like you do not want anyone delivered. <laughs> Hallelujah. And it's going to be a special meeting because um, we'll be doing something now, um, I would save all the details for next week, but just to give you, um, we're a very responsible ministry, and I believe that um, a holistic approach to the challenges of the times is, is a very wise one, especially in this season. 
And so in light of the difficulty and the things that people you know, are facing, not just in this nation, across Africa, the Lord began to put a burden in my heart um, you know, to invest in a few people and to be able to give a few people an opportunity to um, build businesses, particularly along agro-allied, the agro-allied sector. So we are partnering with um, a business outfit and next week we'll be giving them room to just come a few minutes during the miracle service and um, they'll just be doing a little orientation afterwards they will select at least say maybe 100 people from the family here and train them and will fund them and give them an opportunity to set up farms to set up businesses and uh, so that it can be a contribution to helping to empower people. Are you happy about that? So make sure that you are here. It could be you. God told you that this year you will smile. Perhaps this is how the pathway that he will follow. And so um, please make sure you are here. And then on the 3rd of March, by the grace of God, is going to be a wonderful time in this place, we're going to be having two incredible people whose worship ministries have impacted my life, impacted this ministry. We'll be having Terry McHalmond. <laughs> Hallelujah. And um, praise the name of the Lord. Thank you. So. Terry McHalmon, for many of you who know, he's traveled around the world. He's ministered in many powerful crusades. He's behind many songs that you do not even know he's behind. You sing the songs, crying in the presence of God. And um, by God's grace, you'll be live here with my dear friend and brother, Pastor Nathaniel. <laughs> Hallelujah. So it's going to be an uncensored worship experience. It's called Shouts of Victory according to Psalm 118 and verse 15. The Bible says, give it to us, then we'll pray over the bill. It says, the, is it 118 and 15? Did I get that right? Help me. The shouts of joy and victory. Please look for it for me. If that was a mistake, correct it very quickly. The shouts of joy and victory shall not depart from the tent of the righteous. That's the scripture that I'm looking for. Hallelujah. Find it for me and then we'll pray. That's right. Psalm 118 verse 15. Shouts of joy and victory. Okay, NIV. That, that's NIV. KJV says something else. But shouts of joy and victory resounds in the tent of the righteous. Then it says the Lord's right hand has done mighty things. So we're going to be shouting because every Jericho wall must fall in the name of Jesus. Invite everyone and it's going to be a spectacular service for next week and then the week after that is the third. Stretch your hands and let's declare that in the name of Jesus it will be a wonderful experience with two great vessels that God is using to lead nations in worship. Terry McCalmond, Pastor Nathaniel Bassi, and their team pray that in the name of Jesus they will minister under a heavy unction of the Spirit. And that all who must become part of this worship experience, this service, that the Lord himself will bring them from across this nation, from across the nations. It will be an incredible time of the Spirit that many things will be birthed in the Spirit. Many worshipers, many sounds will come. Many victories will be established even in the course of this meeting. And to Jesus be all the glory. Amen and amen. So please let everyone know. It's your duty to let everyone know. Invite friends, loved ones. And um, we'll have a great time in God's presence. Are you ready for tonight? Last week's message impacted me so much. You would not think that, um, you would imagine that I were a stranger hearing it. Even though I was the person God used to teach and for those of you who have not gotten the teaching to listen to it 
It's online. Go to Koinonia Global. You'll get it. Followers of them. Profound teaching about the value and the advantage of models, the advantage of patterns. And all through the week was quite a busy and eventful one, but I kept meditating um, on the things that God shared to us on Sunday. And it stirred up another hunger in me, uh, quite honestly. Um, particularly day before yesterday, yesterday, and even this morning on my way returning back to Abuja, I started thinking about the many people whose lives have impacted me and this ministry. And I started to imagine my life and imagine this ministry without them. Um, very profound people, some dead, some alive. And um, we have stood by the grace of God on the shoulder of veterans, great men and women. They have instructed, they have guided directly or through their materials. And they have brought us to places today that we never dreamt possible. And the things that I'm going to be sharing with you tonight is in honor to one of these veterans. Even though he's gone to be with the Lord, he still remains a profound influence in my life and his influence remain indelible in my heart. And this is a tribute really, uh, if I would call it, to him even though he's not in the earth again. But I look at the extent of his impact even on this wise over my life. And I thought it was important to one more time acknowledge him and sincerely celebrate him and then we go into our discussion. I'm talking about none other than Dr. Miles Monroe. <laughs> Hallelujah. It was on a glorious morning on this very day, I was in the city of Wari, preaching at a conference when I woke up, I think I woke up to pray early hours of the morning and then I was told that he had died in a plane crash. And I said, what happened? Why would such a great man die in a plane crash? Um, but then he died alongside his wife, his assistant, and I think their wives or so. And um, it was quite an impactful loss, if I would call it, for the Bahamas Faith Ministry International. But then he lives on today we have become extensions of his legacy. I kept meditating even this morning on the many things I learned from him. It was from this great man, Dr. Miles, that we learned the value and the excellency of purpose. And that knowing your call and your assignment on time is an advantage to your life. It was from Dr. Miles Munro I learned, for instance, that leadership is not about looking for people to lead. It's a very poor idea of leadership. Unfortunately, that is largely the idea of leadership we have in Africa. Looking for people called followers, then we lead them. He taught us and mentored us into a superior understanding that leadership is about discovering, refining, and developing your giftings and potential and deploying them to serve so effectively that your influence and your impact becomes noticed by the people within your environment and they give you as a reward the gift of loyalty. This was his definition of leadership. That leadership is about deploying your giftings to serve, not looking for men to lead. Hallelujah. Profound contributions. It was from him I understood the kingdom. His book, Rediscovering the Kingdom, has remained a classic, bringing superior ideas taking us beyond the shores of religion and adding to our understanding. And today, by the grace of God, it is an honor to be making our own contribution to the body of Christ and even to this generation. We hope that someday if Christ tarries, someone will be able to point to our lives too and say we live meaningful lives. I hope that will be true for you. <laughs> Anytime I talk about things that relate to death, Everybody keeps quiet. Why are you afraid of dying? You will not die. I've told you this. Hallelujah. 
I'm sure someone is saying, no, I've not built, I've not married, no way, I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> so God bless Dr. Miles Monroe. God bless his works. God bless his legacy in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Lamentations 10, 27. I'm teaching tonight on maximizing destiny. Maximizing destiny. You will want to listen to the things that I'm teaching and the credit for these thoughts are directly connected to this great man, uh, quite directly connected to him. Um, I have done very little editing as far as the knowledge that I've received on this wise. He helped me understand the concept of destiny so thoroughly. And there are a few questions we are going to ask and hopefully answer tonight. And I guarantee you by the integrity of scripture that the answers to this question will be for you a compass to a new horizon in destiny in the name of Jesus Christ. Lamentations 10, 27. Media, are we together? Lamentations, is it 10 or 3, 27? Did I miss that? It is good that a man bear his yoke in his youth. If I omit any scripture, help me. Thank you. Sometimes um, we just keep the verses or we interchange them. It is good, the Bible says, for a man that he bear his yoke in his youth this immediately suggests to us that timing matters in the kingdom hallelujah that not every time is convenient for everything second scripture ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 1 ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 1 remember now it says thy creator in the days of thy youth while the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. The Bible is charging us to remember the Creator that you must walk with this understanding and, this, and with this awareness that God exists and that the reason why you exist is because He is there and that there is a mandate upon your life. Our precious worship people just sang and stared us into understanding that there's prophecy upon our lives and it's important not just to sing it but we must have a profound understanding now many people live lives that are empty and void of meaning lives full of identity crisis lives of purposelessness lives without meaning the average person who is walking gallivanting the earth today cannot clearly articulate why they are here. Hallelujah. For many people, they just live to exist. So the trajectory for the average unenlightened person is to be born. Find yourself growing. If you are fortunate, you attend a secular system of education. Eventually, you transit from childhood to teenage, adolescence, become an adult. Then hopefully marry, have a family and then struggle your way and then at the end of your life if you are fortunate to have good children and grandchildren lucky for you if it's unfortunate for you you join you join the bandwagon of people regretting their lives and then you die most likely of some terrible ailment or some misuse of your body and your life and your times do you think that is a worthy template that is not an effective template for living and yet many people today keep following that road and you would think because others have gone ahead making the same mistakes, those who are coming would see, notice, and correct it. And yet it continues to be the same mistake from person to person. This is true for Africans, true for Europeans, true for people down west. And tonight God wants to help us understand that destiny and life is a gift. A gift that can be abused, but a gift that can be maximized. The intent for this teaching is that in the nearest future, not just at the end of your life, that within the nearest future you can look back and see that you have repositioned your life and you are maximizing destiny. One of the factors that is responsible for joy and happiness, even from a secular standpoint, is progress. We feel happy and we feel fulfilled to the degree to which we feel we are making constructive progress. 
It is the reason why people frown at things like delay. They frown at things like stagnation. If you're a man of God, for instance, and you begin a ministry, and after three, four, five years, the ministry is not growing, not just numerically, in terms of impact, in terms of membership, finances, your influence, it becomes a source of concern. Even biologically, when a woman gives birth to a child, you expect that after two, three, four years, the child would grow, the child would be able to speak, the child will be able to do things by himself or herself. And if that child becomes incapacitated after two, three, four years, it becomes a matter of concern. And the parents now start focusing on seeing how they can get medical or spiritual help. So God designed men to grow. God designed men to advance. God designed men to excel. Are we together? To excel in every ramification. The Bible says in Luke 2.52, And Jesus increased in wisdom. He increased in stature. He increased in favor with God and with men. Nobody wants to remain stagnated indefinitely in life and destiny. As a man of God, I am happy and encouraged, even though I love the Lord sincerely, even beyond the results. But I am encouraged that whilst I'm teaching, week in, week out, there are faithful people who are coming to listen and that the ministry is growing in leap and bounds. If that is true for me, it means it should be true for anyone and everyone. Hallelujah. And I'm praying for you in the name of Jesus Christ that everything that has stunted your growth, that you will not move forward, you will not go forward, and people look at your life and say, what is wrong with you? It looks like you are not making advancement. You are 40, you are still with your parents. 50, you are still with your parents. With your wife and children, but you are still begging from your parents. May that cause come to an end now. Amen. Shout a loud amen. Amen. In Matthew chapter 16 from verse 13, Jesus asked a very profound question. And this was a question that led to the revelation of the church. The word church was first mentioned in this discourse. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, the Bible says, he asked his disciples saying, who do men say? Listen carefully. Not who do angels say? Not who do demons say? Who do men say that I the son of man am? This is a question probing into an understanding of identity. This teaching tonight captures three areas. One, identity. Two, purpose. Three, meaning. The jurisdiction of tonight's teaching is to bring enlightenment across these three areas. Number one, again, identity. Number two, purpose. Number three, meaning. Verse 14. They said, some say that you are John the Baptist. Some say you are Elijah or Elias. Some say you are Jeremiah or even one of the prophets. Next verse, he says, but whom say ye that I am? And like I've taught here many times, they were shocked to know that even though they were in close proximity with Jesus, they really did not know who he was. Next verse. And Peter spoke by the Spirit and said, Thou art Christ, the son of the living God. I know your identity. I'm walking with you, but I am not confused. You are not one of those prophets. Those prophets came because you are here. Those prophets excel because you are here. You are not just joining the queue. You are God himself, Christ, the son of the living God. And he said, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven, and he says, upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Dr. Miles Monroe taught very profoundly and I'm grateful to God that when he taught, some of us listened. There were people who heard but did not listen. There were others who did not even care to listen. They were busy trying to figure their way out through life. Recall my teaching last week. The truth is that the easiest way to make constructive progress in life, I taught you last week, is when you partner with models. Models who have been able to pay the price to find the way for you. Eventually, you may find other paths they have not found. But you will have to leverage on the advantage of their presence, their knowledge, their experience to prime your advancement first. 
ignoring every resource available for you both human and material and spiritual in a quest to becoming in a quest to making it will only leave you in defeat in shame and disappointment and so dr munro said very profoundly that in his opinion and i agree with him till date that there were certain questions that every man would have to ask and answer if they desired destiny maximization it was dr mike mudok who said a question is the seed for an answer that means the difference between a madman talking speaking gibberish is that he's not answering he's just speaking are we together now an answer is a response not just talking not just discussion so when you want an answer the seed that you sow for the harvest of an answer is a question and i want to challenge you the same way god used dr miles to challenge me what you call koinonia global today and by the privilege of god's grace if there is anything good that has come out of this life that is speaking to you credit it to the ability to answer to know and to walk with these questions they have remain pillars during my retreat i probe myself again along these questions and if for any reason i have difficulty answering any of them that becomes my next project are you ready there are five questions he taught us that every man must be able to ask to live an effective life and to actualize destiny don't assume don't pretend you know if you have gotten these questions and your answers are right, your destiny should be speaking now. If for any reason, even if you believe that you have got some knowledge of this, perhaps from his materials, once your knowledge has not produced results, keep listening and keep learning. It means there is something wrong with your understanding because faith has two layers. One is awareness. The second is comprehension. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing. The first hearing is on to awareness. The second hearing is on to comprehension or understanding. You're still with me, shout amen. amen. The first question that we are going to be asking and answering tonight is a question of identity. It's a question, who am I? Please write it down. Who am I? It's a profound question that attempts to bring to your consciousness the concept and the value of identity psychologists and religious leaders and even scientists agree at this point that an individual who does not know himself or herself is already on the path to doom and the path to defeat there are many people today who are under the pressure to become several things depending on who is putting the pressure on them hallelujah and it is simply because they have not taken out time to study their identity identity is a very powerful thing it's a very profound thing sadly our world is gradually losing the sense of identity and it's resulting to all kinds of pressure people trying to show that they are making it preachers not being patient with process until they become business people leaders and so on and so forth identity crisis is a dangerous psychological cancer it can destroy a great destiny it is important that from the onset these are not questions you should ask at the end of your life these are the questions that guarantee you're reaching the end successfully are we together now there are certain questions you have the liberty of asking as you go but these are questions that are best answered before the journey or at the infancy of the journey so that if you have to turn back you would not have wasted years before making a u-turn are we learning now the thing about the school of the spirit and the school of destiny is that even if you are in error moving in the wrong direction for 20 years by the time you find the right path god will mandate that you return back and start the journey afresh you would think you would just shift to a new lane it doesn't work like that in the spirit hallelujah imagine spending 10 15 years of your life following a path that seemed right unto you only to find out that is a way of destruction is a way of failure and then you have to make that u-turn again 
The same distance you wasted arriving at your place of error is the same distance you will spend to come back to the point where you will start again. I'm praying that you will pay attention to the things that you are hearing so that you will not have to answer this question when your children are answering their own. Did you hear what I said? There are many people who will refuse to answer this question and they will be forced to repeat the classes in the school of the spirit and now answer this question together with their children or answer this question together with their grandchildren. And life has no respect for time that was ill-invested. If you did not invest in your time to maximize moments, you, your children will join you in the school of the spirit. Your grandchildren will join you in the school of the spirit. And they will ask you, why are you answering this question at this point? The question of identity. Psalm 49 and verse 20. The Bible says a man that is in honor and understandeth it not is like a beast in the field that perisheth. Do you know what that means? Assuming you are royalty, for instance, maybe you came from a royal family, but you were never told for whatever reason, you will act like a slave and even be victimized by people who you were supposed to be higher than in terms of the privilege that you have. Many believers, because they do not understand their identity, they go through all kinds of psychological swings trying to become the kind of person who will gain an applause from people. Let me tell you this. One of the cardinal pillars for effective leadership and becoming an influence is having a strong conviction of your identity. Because as you sojourn through life and destiny, hear me ladies and gentlemen, culture will try to redefine you. The failure of people will try to redefine you. The thinking of the time will try to redefine you. For instance, in our world right now, when you see a young man and perhaps pressing honorably to his life and destiny, chances are excellent that he will feel like a failure because he does not have a car, he does not have maybe some house, and so on and so forth. And there are many people who are actually doing well, but simply because society has given a wrong parameter to measure masculinity, a wrong parameter, to measure growth, a wrong parameter, to measure ministry, a wrong parameter, to measure success. The fake life that is eating up the average young man in our society is credited directly to identity crisis. Hallelujah. So even if I'm a dummy, once I am in a car and I'm driving it, I immediately have a sense of superiority to everybody thinking. That is the reason why many young people today have found themselves in all kinds of destructive vices. Almost every week, the law enforcement agents are apprehending someone who is involved in some kind of shady practice, some kind of destructive practice. And you ask the young man, what exactly are you looking for? The cliche in our world today is I want to make it. Who is the I? That is the question we want to ask. Who is the I who wants to make it? Society has told us that we are failures when certain things does not happen, when certain things does not add up. Are we together? And some of you right now in this place, you are, you literally, you would have been better by far if you had that sense of self-security for want of word upon the strength of who God has made you. Some gentleman looked at you and said you are not a beautiful lady and that destroyed your sense of self-worth and you started acting and doing things, even stupid things because you are trying to fit. There is a cancer that is eating up young people in our world today is the pressure to belong. Have you heard such a statement? So they create mundane parameters that you must qualify to join certain groups or certain people and they are not all wrong, but there are some that are so destructive. There are groups and people today that if you are a sound Christian and you love the Lord, living a responsible life as a young man and a young lady, those groups will send you away. They will say you are too innocent to be part of them. They want bad people. It's, it's like a credit. 
If you say you are a well-behaved person, they say, no, you are too naive and you are too stupid to work with us. We need people who are prone to destruction, prone to anger, prone to rebellion. Are we together? Someone who can beat anyone once you are angry and then they call it all kinds of names. And some of us who were once well-behaved are now becoming something that we were not designed by God because of the pressure to belong. Dressing, speaking, social media. There are people who were dressing well until they met certain groups of people and they told them, if you keep dressing like this, you will not marry. Now that you have changed, what has happened? Say deception. deception. Yeah. The basic definition of witchcraft is to cause someone to err using the tool of deception. Hallelujah. How about young men with the value of respect and dignity and honor? But then here comes a group of very confused but arrogant people who now begin to put pressure on your identity. And they say, Mr. Man, at the rate at which you are going, you will never get established. There is a way we do things. And after two years of foolish work, you find yourself in the prison. Perhaps for the next 10 years. Perhaps for the next 15 years. And the thing is that when you get into trouble, all the people who motivated you into that trouble will not come and own up and say, we are here for you. Hmm. Who am I? It's a question that I had to answer in my life. If you know who you are, you will reject the pressure from men to become anything God did not say about you. Hallelujah. For instance, I learned from this revelation that having a car and having a house is not what defines me. I'm not saying those things are wrong. But if I suddenly feel good about my life just when I have a car and a house, it's a risk. What then happens when the car spoils? Your value for yourself also drops. So if I stand in the midst of someone who has a better dressing than me, I begin to feel like a failure. By what parameter? Who brought these parameters? It's time for you to begin to probe the things that represent the epicenter of your self-worth. Now, I'm not saying to not be challenged because there are some of us who really need to be challenged. If people don't challenge you, you will never leave that psychological cocoon that you are in. So being challenged is a good thing for many people. Hallelujah. Yes. There are people today, for instance, who are not earning up to, say, 100,000 a month. But every great hotel, maybe in this city or restaurant, you will find them there. You are here again, say yes. <laughs> who is paying for this? No, by myself. 20,000 out of a salary of 100,000. You didn't tithe, you didn't give, you didn't save, you didn't do anything. And then, while the food is there, you now take um, this thing you put take. And then you send it and say, look, maybe God is good or to God be the glory. And then the people you hope to see, as always, you know I'm not being sarcastic, I'm probing you. What you see today that you call koinonia, Ladies and gentlemen, it's not just a journey of faith alone. It's a journey of patience. Life challenged our identity in various ways. But thanks be to God for the resilience to remain. When you find out what God has said about you, it doesn't matter who misunderstands. Or do, Many of us today want great organizations. You want to lead ministries. You want to lead businesses. And someone says stupid and you are crying. Am I, is this how I am? You mean this sister just looks at me and says, but the question is, are you stupid? Has the word of God ever told you you are stupid? Those who mentor and lead you, have they ever told you you are stupid? So someone who has no investment whatsoever in your life wants to come and stake, claim a stake in your mind and you give them permission, you give them entrance into your mind. Before I listen to you, I must see the contribution you have made to my destiny. You don't come as a stranger and want the seat of somebody who has made meaningful investments. Is someone learning now? So you must know how to edit opinions and throw rubbish to the, to the bin and keep moving. Someone looks at you and says, you look like you are not a powerful Christian. From you, I, I suspect that I said, this lady, you will most likely not be a great lady. Congratulations for your ignorance. 
Watch as you learn and ask God for forgiveness for the remaining part of your life. Because as for me, I'm evolving. Because like our people sang, the word of God is with me. The Holy Spirit is with me. God has placed models before me and a determination to succeed. No, there is no power in existence that sustains what it takes to keep you down. Are we together? I don't have the time to tell you everything the Bible says you are, but I will keep reminding you, my dear people, among the many things the Bible says about you is that you are light, you are salt. Say, I am light. Let the devil hear it. Say, I am salt. Yes, he says you are wonderfully and fearfully made. Yes, sir. He says you are the apple of his eyes. If God is that vulnerable about you, don't let some guy who has not made any meaning to your life, he's still figuring his left from his right, just comes and uses his ignorance to define you. And you go back crying and begin to live a life that is outside the script of your destiny. Our world has gained mastery in bullying people psychologically. Oh, look at this lady. She's not fine. Look at this guy. His head is too big. What kind of human being is this? Many of our children today are joining occults and joining all kinds of satanic things thanks to those kinds of negative statements. So when you tell a lady she's not beautiful, enough. When you tell a guy he's broke, he doesn't have money, enough. You put pressure on them to start doing a lot of things. But in the name of Jesus, I'm telling you now, everything Satan has been whispering to your ears that did not come from scripture, we decree and declare, may those sounds cease in your life. Is someone learning? Sinatch taught us powerfully. I live a life of favor. I know I. There's a part of the song I like. Take a look at me, I'm a wonder. Listen, you've been singing it. You. Yes, listen. This is how you people don't learn. You have been crying with that song in your head. Now allow me to teach you what the song means. You hear what that song says? It says, take a look at me, I'm a wonder. It doesn't matter what you see now. Sounds to me like scripture. Mm. It doesn't matter what you see. Don't let the 20 naira trousers deceive you. The person inside is a company that is rising. Don't be deceived that after the grace, while others are hopping into their cars, God bless them. And you are walking after such a powerful message and you are asking so what did i fall down for you are joking you don't know what entered your spirit the bible says now are we the sons of god and it does not yet appear if you had seen some of us 15 20 years ago and they told you this version of us exists in that version you will not believe it do you know the other versions that are still in you you have seen the weak one. Thank God you have seen the weak one once and for all so that every other thing you see is the strong one evolving. Yes, sir. Do you believe what you are hearing? Man of God, I know you've not started ministry, but it doesn't mean the call is not there. You think we're always celebrated? No. I taught my dear people in Zaria, you work out your own salvation. It does not start with doing. It starts with believing something about yourself. Hallelujah. When people hang themselves, what do you think leads them to go and get a rope? You know how painful it is to hang yourself and watch yourself die? Yet there are people who prefer that because life has told them something. I was told a story, I think it's just a maybe some fiction to illustrate a point that somebody was angry with life and he was wearing some clothes that were not really nice and he was on his way to go and hang himself and there was a beggar who was watching him when he saw him tying the rope he said please sir since you are going to die why don't you remove what you have and just give me because at least if you die you'll be naked and the man turned and said so what I'm wearing that I think is a shame is somebody's prayer request do you know how many people are secretly praying to be you 
They have seen something in you you have not seen. Your focus is just beauty. Whereas they've seen virtue and they are praying. They've seen character and they are praying. Is someone learning? You are just looking at, uh, for want of what, six pack or whatever number you are, you are looking for. Whereas someone is seeing a loyal, a trusted person. If you are hearing, say amen. amen. God used Dr. Munro to train some of us to understand that the world will only celebrate what you celebrate. If you hate yourself and you do not celebrate yourself, it is fraud to ask people to celebrate someone you hate yourself. Somebody after this service, you need to go back and say, Lord, you've done me well, oh. Thank God for the gift of me. Are we together? That there's somebody today with all due respect, with no arms and no feet, and yet he's still confident about his life. Have you seen people like that? God left them, I believe, to be inspirations to us. You have your hand, you have your feet, you have everything complete, and you are still saying you are not good enough. Now, who am I? You need to answer that question now. And you do not identify yourself with things. If you say, I am a millionaire, uh, that is not bad, but that is not an intelligent answer. A millionaire means one who has millions. No. There is a more superior understanding that produces such a person. What happens to you if all the millions leave? What happens to you if all the fame and everything leaves? Most people have defined themselves with the things around them. So you live a life that looks like a failure and a miserable person. Suddenly you get a job with some oil and gas firm and you square up immediately. Hallelujah. Sitting in front here does not change me. Truly, I, I tell you, believe me when I tell you this. If I sit at the back, I'm still Joshua Selman, full of everything God gave me. And if you doubt it, you will give me time to prove it. Are we together now? Many people because of identity crisis today have gathered all kinds of enemies. I came to the occasion and they called me Joshua Selman, not Apostle Joshua Selman. Okay, they made a mistake. Sorry, it's all right. No, I won't forgive them. I went for a wedding and they started serving the other people before me. Okay, sorry. It was a, a mistake. No, that means you are saying they are higher than me. Who told you? Are we together? You were introducing people and you introduced brother A before brother B. So you are trying to say brother A is more important. Are you seeing how failure keeps suggesting things that is not even in the minds of people? I have taught you this. Someone can be looking at you like this. And you say this, this look looks like hatred. And the person is thinking about his rent. Not you. The person is just looking at you but honestly under God. What he's thinking about is how to beg his landlord. My dear people, hear me. This is not a call to being pompous, being loud without reason, but it's a call to a settled sense of confidence. No matter what you say about me, provided you are not God and you are not anyone in front of me that I respect, you only wasted your energy and your sound. Do you have that kind of courage? Because there are many times as you'll be learning, you will have to walk alone. Are we together now? I believe everything God says he has made me. My sufficiency is not of myself, but of Christ, who has made me an able minister. Many years ago, I used to share this humorously. Um, those days when we started and I started traveling, I didn't used to wear all these kinds of things. I would just wear a polo and a jean and my palm, just flying. And you see the people waiting at the airport for the great man of God, whose message they have listened to, largely audio. So most of them have not seen me. Usually a few people will recommend to the church, you need to bring this man of God. Then I come down from the plane and they are looking at me. They are wondering, is it my protocol? Is it this? And when they see me, you can see the shock and the disappointment. I mean, this is what we've been waiting for. 
And then I greet them sometimes and they're like, okay, that's the car, please enter and let's go. <laughs> ah, it's not my fault. God put the grace in me. <laughs> Hallelujah. And then usually after the meeting, they announce, saying, sir, when again are you going to be, um, um, when will you be free? It's such a privilege. And I'm saying, look at the same people. <laughs> Let me tell you the truth. When you know who you are, you don't need to waste time telling people who you are. <laughs> if you find yourself always trying to say who you are, it is a mechanism to manage your not knowing who you are. Does a lion tell you it's a lion? Lions roar. And it stops there. An eagle does not need to tell you I'm an eagle. Keep watching the sky. Sooner or later, you will see that there is only one bird that is soaring with such level of mastery. That bird is not called a pigeon. It's called an eagle. Are we together? The pressure to try to prove a point is something that must die permanently. If anybody thinks you are a failure, forgive their ignorance while they learn. And if they insist that you are a failure, leave them with God, the one who called you to make you successful. If a gentleman looks at you and says you are not fine enough, thank God because you would have married the wrong person. Let him carry his trouble and go. Are we together now? Did you hear what I'm saying? And if some lady tells you that she wants somebody with all the money in the world, bless God for her. And thank God for the one who will see you while you are rising so that you will not have any fear when you rise. identity crisis my dear people hear me there is more within you than you will ever imagine there is more within you yes you can be a work in progress don't let your limitations define you did you hear what I said yes it does not mean to embrace everything including what is destroying your life that's not what I'm advocating some of you have very bad manners with all due respect some of you are not people of character. Some of you are not visionary people. I'm not saying embrace that part of you, but have it that there is potential within your spirit. The Bible says we are born of the incorruptible seed of the word of God. Hallelujah. I heard God's servant, Bishop David Oedipo, say that there's nowhere he will go in the world, that the Lord gave him something he calls a far above mentality, that there is nowhere he will go in the world that he will allow himself to be intimidated, and he's proved it with his life. Now, there is a false sense of confidence where you abuse and insult people. They say, lift your hand. You say, no, I'm fearfully and wonderfully. No, you are rude and ill-trained. That is not how fearfully and wonderfully made people behave. This is not my advocacy. Are you, are you getting me now? Yes. Or you sound very sarcastic. You laugh at people. You fight people and say, I'm like that. No. That's an attack. Come next week. So that you, your problem is solved once and for all. But I'm teaching someone here who before the alert comes to your account, you are still confident. You are in one room and you don't hide where you are staying. You don't follow through a three bedroom and turn around and go to your one bedroom because you are trying to show that you are what is there to be afraid of are we together you are not the first to stay in one room you are not the first to have one cooking pot stay there with honor and snap it while you are there because it will become a monument tomorrow that one room is not your house that one room is a retreat center. Pray there. Know God there. Fast there. Build there. Read books there. And emerge. When you become bigger than that room, that room will run away from you. It's true. There is a level you get to in the spirit where it becomes unfair to remain there. That room will run away. Even if you don't leave it, it will leave you. Who am I? I'm showing you the kind of training that constructed our understanding. So that today, by the privilege of God's grace, things and people and achievements is not what defines some of us by the grace of God. Thank God for the crowns, the accolades and everything, but my identity as the son of God 
supersedes my identity as any other thing. I know that I'm the son of God. I'm a child of God, loved by him, jealously loved by him. Koinonia or otherwise, if you have this mentality, believe me, there are many things you will not cry about again. There are many things you will not have to discuss about again. You will save yourself wasteful um, times in prayer and invest in constructive prayer. Lord, look at what people are saying about me. <laughs> no. Hallelujah. Some gentleman who just came here now, you may not look like it, but my goodness, God is doing something in you. Hallelujah. So we live fake lives, trying to buy a designer watch. I'm not saying anything is wrong with that. Designer this, designer that, and claiming all kinds of things, running into debt, getting into trouble, aligning with wrong people who bring wrong values to destroy us. And many of us cannot be alone. One of the ways that you have truly gained security is the power to be alone. And yet, no, you are not alone. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. What's the revelation? For thou art with me. Who am I? This is what we teach and train the students in the school of ministry. Among the many things. Listen, my life changed. I don't know how insecure, maybe how, I don't know what kind of life I would have been living today. And with all due respect, I have watched people and I continue to watch with shock and sympathy, genuine sympathy. I have seen the danger of identity crisis. When it comes upon a leader, when it comes upon an individual, it will make you do things you will hate, but you will still keep doing it. Because you are trying to gain the applause of men. First John chapter 3 and verse 1. We need to hurry up. I sense that God is speaking to someone. I sense that God brought someone to church tonight to tell the person, the way you are going, you will not make it that way. The pressure to prove a point. You borrow cars, you borrow clothes, you borrow everything. Are we together? You want to, that, that obsession for visibility. No, God gives visibility, but not by manipulation. When you merit it by growth, it comes naturally. I taught you here in Koinonia two years or so ago that success is not what you pursue. Success is what you attract by who you become. If you steal tomorrow's bread today, you will be hungry tomorrow. You are stealing from tomorrow's kitchen to eat it today. If all I have is Jesus, I've got something more than gold. I will tell it to my world. Jesus is more than gold. If all I have is Jesus, I've got something more than gold. I will tell it to my world. Jesus is more than gold. Sing it one more time. That if all I have is Jesus, I've got something more than gold. I will tell it to the world. Jesus is more than gold. Let me tell you why I'm teaching you this. The journey from where most people are until they become is quite long. It will take time. And for the most part of that journey, you'll be walking alone. You will walk alone in the midst of noises that you will be hearing. You will not make it. You can't go far. I taught them in Zaria again. If you had looked at Joseph, the one in the pit, not the one in the palace, you would look at him and there would be nothing that looked like prophecy upon him. But he had the self-security to continue. Such that even when he was in the prison, he knew he was not in a, a prisoner. He was just in a prison. It's one thing to be in a prison, but it's another thing to identify yourself as a prisoner. If you are call yourself a prisoner, even if you are in a palace, you are still a prisoner. Hallelujah. I can be in a condition that does not exactly reflect prosperity, but in my mind that can be rich unto God and rich unto a sound mind. I will not fake my life, 
but right where I am, I know in my mind that the nations, this is the orientation that we had. You may be in the prison, but never call yourself a prisoner. If you call yourself a prisoner, even if the door is open, you are still in prison. Who am I? Question two. The second question that we had to answer by the spirit of grace. Did I give you references for this? Write for who am I? First John 3 and verse 1. Then Matthew 5, 13 to 16. First John 3 and verse 1. Then Matthew chapter 5, 13 to 16. Very quickly, let me give you the second question. Where am I from? This is powerful. This question attempts to help you understand your source and your connection. For many years, I did not understand the value of answering this question. Where am I from? Because the Bible says in John chapter 3 and verse 31, John 3, 31, He that cometh from above, He that cometh from above, He that comes from the West is most likely a Westerner. He that comes from the East is most likely an Easterner. He that comes from the North is a Northerner, a Middle Beltan, and so on and so forth. He that comes from America is most likely an American, and so on and so forth. And wherever you come from, you will also be a victim of the limitations that are domiciled there. Did you get this? So when the Bible says, he that cometh from above, the revelation there is that even though I have a natural descent, I come from a place plagued with advantages and disadvantages like we all have, but that you sustain an orientation that even though I am from Lagos, Port Harcourt, I'm from America, I'm from UK, I'm from Bauchi, wherever I am from, my real origin is not the place that I feel in a form. My real origin is that I come from above. And the Bible says by reason of that source, there is something within you that is consistent with where you come from. And eventually it will emerge. Are we together? John chapter 1, 6 and 7. The Bible says there was a man sent from God whose name was John. I've taught you here whose name was Joshua Selman. Verse 7, the same came for a witness to bear witness to the light that all men through his witness might believe. Say I come from above. Listen, look at me. When you say I come from above, I like you to see yourself rising above causes. Rising above that thing that says women return back to their husband's homes. Men return back to their, where do they return back to now? Their parents' homes. Are we together? People rise and fall, minus me. Oh, minus me, in the name of Jesus. Anybody waiting for a worse tomorrow is waiting forever. Uh-uh. There is an immunity. There is, there is a jealousy that holds and defends us. Hallelujah. Are we together? He that cometh from above. Listen, I learned this mentality, not just from Dr. Miles Monroe, but also from Smith Wigglesworth. I read one of his books and it, it, it opened the fountains of my faith. He that cometh from above. You cannot solve any problem thinking at the level of that problem. You must believe you are higher than it before you are able to solve it. He that cometh from above is above all. He that cometh from above. I'm a proud Nigerian, very proud of my nation. I tell you, unashamedly proud of my nation. But I can tell you one thing, I come from above. The color of my skin looks Nigerian. But watch the results. You will know that it comes from a realm that is not even earthly. Are we together? God is helping you solve something here. So when people look at you and say, you come from this region, you people are angry people. You come from this region. You are jealous people. You come from this region. You don't live long. They may be right by your natural descent. But remind yourself that I have been called out of every tribe, out of every tongue, out of every nation. Are we together now?
Say, I come from above. Say it convincingly. I come from above. Yes, sir. Nathaniel looked at Jesus and said, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Jesus was not offended because from an earth standpoint, Nathaniel was right. I've taught you here. Remember, Samson was a Nazarene. They didn't have longevity of impact. Something would happen to them and bring them down. But Jesus said, minus me. In the name of Jesus Christ, I come from above. That is why the power I carry is from above. That is why when I speak to you, the result comes from above. Because I come from above. The Bible says, set your mind, your affection on the things that are above. Listen, this revelation has helped me in ministry. I have never, with all due respect to my nation, I have never done ministry like a Nigerian. I have never acted just with the mindset of a limited, uh, a limited mindset. When I hear people abuse Africa and say all kinds of things, I respect them, but I know that we are a superior breed. Here's what the Bible says. You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a peculiar people. Say it again, I am from above. You may not see that in my speaking. You may not see that in my, the color of my skin, perhaps. You may not see that in, in my, my body, my size and all of that. But there is a divine ability. We are born of the Spirit. Does a man lay hand on a man and heal the person by his strength? No. It takes a man plus something divine. Nicodemus comes to Jesus by night and says, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher sent from God. For no man can do these miracles which thou doest except God be with him except God be with him except God be with him we look like ordinary men but we can speak to nations and speak to the gates of nations to be open and if you ask why it is not just the size of my hand the size of my mouth what I'm saying it is because we come from above if you know that you come from above you will know that that business will not fail you will know that that destiny will not fail that even though my beginning is small there is something from above that does not allow me to be a failure so when you fail as an event you dose yourself and, and square up and know that a champion is still imagined. Hallelujah. This is the mindset we had. Right from the days of infancy when we were organizing small crusades with small people, limited resources, full of all kinds of troubles that were evolving beyond our knowledge. From above. I knew that one day I would give to nations. I knew that one day I would lend to nations. I saw it from scripture. I have no apology for being a blessing. None whatsoever. In the name of Jesus Christ. Say I come from above. There is no power anywhere. Whether from whatever village. Whatever. whatever. Thankfully thank God for my traditional rulers who came here. And thank God for the efforts that they are making, dedicating my place to the Lord. Make up your mind. If they say you come from a place where your great-grandfather was a priest and the thing was, is now looking for you, you better say I'm not available. I am not available. I am already a priest unto God. Oh, it's looking for you and if you don't come, it will kill you. Everything tying you down connected to where you are coming from everything tying your destiny down you've seen it held hold those who went ahead of you you've seen it hold your father your mother maybe untimely death maybe failure maybe rising and falling in the name of jesus with this above mentality i cause that spirit now i cause that spirit now i cause that spirit now I curse that spirit now. I curse that spirit now. Everywhere God wants to take me, I believe I can go. Everything he wants me to do, I believe I can do. I respect everyone on earth, but in the name of Jesus Christ, it will not be at the expense of my self-confidence. That is not a wise bargain. The noblest honor any man can be given on earth is to be the son of God. 
the only other position in my opinion that is greater than that or that is after that is the position of a monarch because if you're a monarch you stay there till you die presidents and prime ministers come and go and they have eight years perhaps some have stretched it to decades but it still ended but this status there is no taking it from me hallelujah can't be a slave to fear I come from above I'm living in Abuja the geography of my witness is Abuja but in the name of Jesus any spirit you may have heard me tell you this years ago true story and I want you to listen to me just to buttress on this point then I was not in Abuja I remember coming and I I boarded a cab and whilst we were traveling the man said something that blessed me he said he, he, you know he was speaking in pidgin and here's what he told me he said that he i think he went somewhere to consult with some medium and they told him that there was a spirit in this city that if you hold money in this city it must finish in this city so he was advised that every time he gets money he will run out of the city and go and start a project he was about to finish it i was listening to him while he was speaking he i think they consulted with some medium and the man was giving him his word of knowledge and you find that truly from an earth standpoint is true many people earn so much and after decades they do not have any even even a piece of land something just drains them completely is because you think that your supply comes from here the day you understand that i come from above i come from above i refuse to be limited by what limits men I come from above as a man of God you must believe this an above mentality is a victor's mentality hallelujah now it does not mean you will ignore reality for instance a bag of rice is still what it is now hello you are still from above but a bag of rice is still what it is now saying in my mind a bag of rice is five naira is not what I'm teaching you to know a bag of rice is not five naira a superior thinking is that while we are praying for it to go down so everybody can afford for me an exemption has been designed in my life by reason of where I come from so your lamentation becomes a national one not a personal one as for me I have defined my possibilities do you believe what you are hearing koinonia will only keep rising by the spirit of the Lord because this was not a man's idea it was a heavenly vision received by men executed by grace supervised by his jealousy it will not fail the defense is too much is someone learning where are you from you need to know where you're from you are not answering where are you from when you are filling your form fill your village but in your mind, say above. Above through my village. Above through Kaduna State. Above through Plateau State. Above through Lagos. Someone prophesy. Above through whatever your village is. Listen. Many of you travel transcontinentally. And there's what they call connecting flights. You go to a nation, you have no business visiting the nation, but you just have to be there as a stop point for a few hours to get to your final destination. Am I right on that? Aha. Uh -huh. So, if you find me, say, if I'm traveling, say, to America, and you find me in UK, you are asking, what are you doing here? I tell you, I'm on transit. My final destination and where I'm coming from are the two most important things. Are we together now? You came from above and by his wisdom god passed you through where he passed you so it doesn't matter you are still on transit mm. i come from above the limitations of my territory will never find expression in me by faith i rise above it if it's untimely death it stops with me if it's failure it stops with me if his people rising and then after 10 years they come down minus me i'm prophesying for myself make sure you don't keep quiet in the name of jesus if his people having a track record of consistently burying their children minus me are you still speaking if it's something where you give birth to irresponsible children in the name of jesus it dies with you he that cometh from above 
is above all. Above all. Above all. Number three. What is the third question that gives you stability to maximize life, to maximize destiny? Are you ready? Why am I here? It's a question of purpose. This is powerful. Why am I here? Chapter 4 and verse 34. Jesus spoke so profoundly. My meat, he says, is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish it. John chapter 18 and verse 37. John 18, 37. I like what Jesus said. Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. Watch this. To this end was I born. And for this cause came I into the world that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. Hebrews 10, 7. Lo, I come. In the volume 7 of the book as it is written of me to do thy will O Lord why am I here it is important to know why you are here I am not here to become a victim of what happens around the economy of nations I am not here to just keep growing old and then one day die no no there is a purpose. What's that song? No eye has seen, no ear has heard what God has prepared for me. So I submit to his work in me till Christ be formed in me. You have given me a destiny, a purpose to fulfill. So with all I am, I'll spend my life to see Jesus revealed and Jesus glorified. Jesus revealed. Very powerful song. And Jesus glorified. Listen, you have given me. A destiny, a purpose to fulfill. So with all I am, every breath in me, I'll spend my life to see. I'll spend my time to see. I'll spend my life to see Jesus revealed. And Jesus glorified, Jesus revealed. And Jesus glory. I want you to shout it to the hearing of your destiny and the devil. I was born for a reason. Let failure hear you. Let defeat hear you. think you are being childish saying this help those under the anointing he said let the redeemed of the Lord say so this is how it happens born for a reason it doesn't matter how you arrived even if it was a mistake between a man and a woman that is their concern God did not just God was not surprised watching you upon the earth born for a reason there is a space for me in life and destiny. No one else can occupy that vacuum. No one can intimidate you and bully you out of your place. Hear me. There are many preachers, great preachers, but there are still others. Your space is there. Say it again. I was born for a reason. Yes, sir. Born for a reason. If you don't have this mentality, you will keep escorting people around the corridors of destiny, hating yourself every day, blaming those who gave birth to you. Come on now, born for a reason. You have given me a destiny and a purpose to fulfill. With all I am, every breath in me, I'll spend to see you have given me a destiny a purpose to fulfill with all I am every breath in me I'll spend my life to see Jesus with you and Jesus glorify Jesus with you Oh 
Listen. Imagine the world without Baba Deboe. Imagine the world without Bishop Oyedepo. Imagine the world without the materials and the investment of Dr. Miles Monroe. Imagine the world without Joshua Selman. Imagine the world without you. You are that valuable to God. Listen, you are the, I, I sense an anointing as I'm saying this. I'm not entertaining you. There is, there is, a, there is something God is, is killing out of your life because it's time for your destiny to emerge. He has given you a destiny, a purpose to fulfill. We all you want, every breath in you. Please spend your life to see Jesus revealed and Jesus glorified. Jesus revealed. Listen, imagine if the right brothers were not born. The idea for an aircraft that has helped us to reach nations with the gospel today. Imagine the inventor of this microphone if you were not born. Imagine the ones who invented the automobile. Imagine the many, many tailors in this place who dress us. Imagine the great people who fix this place every week. Imagine that everyone in the worship team was not born. Who will sing? Me? That's not my assignment. Imagine all the mighty men and women of God in this ministry. The mighty leaders. Imagine they were not there. I would have been alone. Whoever told you you are not that valuable. Whoever lied to you that you are just a drop. Whoever lied to you that the world can do without you so they arrogantly say then God would not have put you here. No eye has seen no ear has heard what God has prepared for me. Do you believe what you are hearing? No eye has seen say What God has prepared for me So I submit to His work in me Till Christ You have given me You have given me A destiny And a purpose to fulfill With all I have in me I'll spend my life Imagine the world without the architects who built this. Imagine the world without doctors. Some of us would not even leave to start the ministry. Huh? Imagine that the man who drove you here was not born. Don't act like you can do without men. They are that important. Jesus needed them. He even said in the multitude of men is a king's honor. Look at all the wonderful people today who have made the world know about Koinonia, who have made the world know about Joshua Selman. What if they were not born? All of the churches that extended warm invites to have brought us to a point of visibility. What if they were not born? What if they did not answer the call? Today in my own little way and with all humility, I look at the so many who have come to Jesus, including those who will be coming tonight. What if we were not born? Listen to me. You are that important. You are that important. My brother, my sister, I know that your dad and your mom forgive them that they call you a black sheep. They were just expressing anger and frustration. Don't take it serious. 
black sheep don't learn what you are learning are we together can I tell you in this place are the global financiers of koinonia in the making apostles to the billions people who will send resources and say let's go to the nations in this place are other apostles and prophets greater than joshua selman's rising it is true that someday when you emerge we will be taking notes from you saying my god we've read the bible but we never saw it this way because of the excellency of the workings of the spirit someday maybe some lady will rise from among us here and sing songs that will take his praises to the nation maybe some prophet is on his way rising it does not look like it but hear me do not abort that call of destiny born for a reason why am i here born for a reason when you went to bed like joseph you saw yourself as a businessman signing checks to nations give this mission agency give this to koinonia give this to some place somewhere and you got up and the devil said you are joking listen let me tell you this dare to believe everything god has shown you that is rooted in his will and is rooted in christ because it can come to pass and it will come to pass if you listen to this preacher today there are many things that i saw i started seeing miracles when a single headache was not healed in my visions i believed it how it will happen i did not know but i knew that one day we will not only speak to nations we will extend his life his power to nations i used to see crusades in my dream tens of thousands of people gathered across the nations and then i wake up like joseph a small mattress your room what is going on destiny piecing together yeah. yes destiny piecing together let, him, let me remind you esther if you don't res, if you don't rise the nation of israel will suffer let me remind you ruth if you do not rise and you become discouraged you will stop Boaz from having the children from who Jesus will come out from let me remind you David without you there will be no city called the city of David let me remind you Elijah there are still there is still a room for fiery prophets like you let me remind you Abraham Many people's destinies are connected to your obedience. You cannot afford to give up now. Let me remind you, Anna the prophetess. Nobody has seen you, but keep praying because Jesus needs to come. Remain that intercessor. Pray in the morning. Pray in the afternoon. Pray in the night. You may not be on social media, but keep doing your duties. Keep praying. Listen, and let me tell you something. Hear me. Our assignments are seasonal. And our assignments evolve so there are many of you right now your real destiny is to be a prophet but right now you are in the media department or the worship team don't graduate yourself and bring yourself because you are seeing visions no stay and serve until he blesses you until you emerge philip was part of the people and Stephen were part of the people who were anointed to serve tables but because of the, the openness of their hearts and their prophetic destinies there was more than a welfare grace on them eventually they evolved Philip the evangelist from serving tables now went to Samaria in Acts chapter 8 and verse 5 and preached Christ unto them and was working miracles with power let me tell you this for some of you the reason why your destiny has remained stunted is because you are too big to start small too big to start small how can i be a member of prayer department and that's all i do every week whereas in my destiny i've seen that one day i will be praying even with the fathers you will never get there if you cannot humble yourself to start small how can I be in a welfare department yet there is a mighty prophet imagine from me 
There is nobody who starts where you meet them in glory. They start usually in darkness and they grow as they evolve. David starts from the wilderness, killing the bear, the lion, feeding the sheep, and he's trained to not just become the shepherd, but to become the king. Hallelujah. I vowed to God many years ago, and that still remains my commitment, that everywhere he puts me per time, per season, I will serve with all my heart. Whether I'm here in Abuja, or in Zaria, or anywhere around the world, the stage is the same for me. The assignment is the same. I will preach with as much passion here as I will preach in America, as I will preach in Zaria, as I will preach in a Bible study of three people. I will still shout the truth to their faces until they become. Hallelujah. God is speaking to someone. You have not carried this consciousness of why you are here and you are just getting old. Do you know, in my opinion, you really do not have the legitimacy to elaborately celebrate birthdays till you discover why you were born, not that you were born. Many visionary people waste money celebrating birthdays and they jump around with no definition as to why they are here. And God has given you the gift of time. I told you that when you are celebrating birthdays, don't celebrate your current age. You are celebrating the days left. Not the days you have spent. You are celebrating the days left. That means if you are X years old and it's God's desire that you live say up to 80, and let's say for instance you are 40, you have not just covered, you are halfway your journey, whether you like it or not. So don't just celebrate the past 40 years, be thankful, but look at the next 40 years, what can I do? At the infancy of this ministry, we used to train people, three days to your birthday, you go for a retreat. It's a culture that many still have till today. Three days or one week to your birthday, you don't get up and buy any cake or kill any chicken until you are out of your retreat. You flog it out with destiny asking questions. Lord, at this juncture, what should I do? What is the next step to take? Listen, if your birthday is this month or around the corner, adopt this principle. It doesn't matter who is celebrating you. Let them celebrate sincerely. Go and spend at least a day or two. Lord, I'm tired of wasting time. What is the next blueprint for my prophetic destiny? Hallelujah. But I want you to carry this song in your mind, even as you sleep tonight, that he has given you a destiny. He's giving you prophecy. There's something he said concerning you. The next Benny Hins, the next Elon Musk, the next son, senior advocates, the next apostles, the next prophets. You see, if you refuse to become, you will stop others from becoming because life is a relay. Other people are depending on your faithfulness to emerge. Today you are hearing, you are growing, you are being trained, you are rising in the spirit and in destiny because by the privilege of God's mercy, somebody's obedience is contributing to your becoming. Your obedience also will contribute to someone's becoming. We'll sing it one more time and I'll go to number four. You have given me a destiny and a purpose to fulfill with all I am I'll spend my life to see Jesus revealed and Jesus glorified Jesus revealed and Jesus glorified so question one, identity, who am I? Question two, please be seated. Why am I here? A question of purpose. Question three, what can I do? Uh, question three, why am I here? A question of purpose. Are you ready for question four? What can I do? Your potential, your potential. 
Champions are champions because they live eternally aware of the investments of the spirit within their persons. Whether it's in sports, whether it's in music, whether it's in ministry, whether it's in politics. All those who lead their field are people who are full of confidence in God if they are believers and in the giftings that he's put in them. Philemon chapter 1 and verse 6, write that scripture down and never forget it for the rest of your life. That the communication of your faith may become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. Worship team, what has God given you? Excellent voices, write it down. What has God given you? The grace to receive songs supernaturally, write it down. Listen, there is nobody here under the sound of my voice who is void of a gifting, an ability, a potential. Potential means what can be if it is developed, if it is deployed. Are we together now? A gentleman once met me and said he wants to be able to preach. I said there are two things that are needed for good preaching. Aside from your understanding, in terms of communication, you need oratory and you need utterance. In order of priority, utterance is more superior to oratory. Oratory helps to make utterance effective. Utterance is an engracing from God that helps you articulate your thoughts in such a way and a manner that everybody educated or, on or otherwise can understand. But oratory helps you to construct your ideas such that people can follow your thinking and learn from it. You need both. But in order of priority, utterance supersedes oratory. Are we learning? What do you have? I have been inspired by many people today and it is because of the vast resources that God put within them. I want you to beware of the danger of despising what God has given you. The woman in 2 Kings, I believe, chapter 4, when you read from verse 1 to 4, the Bible says she was the wife of one of the sons of the prophet. And the Bible says she came and said, my husband is dead. And you know that he did fear the Lord. You would think that because he feared the Lord, he should not be in debt. Hallelujah. And the creditor is come to take unto him my two sons to be slaves. Verse 2, watch what Elisha says. Elisha said unto her, what shall I do for thee? Then he says, tell me, what hast thou in the house? This is a question God is asking someone. What do you have in your house? For some of you, you have a, a unique grace to sing. All you need to add is the understanding, character, and anointing on that gift. But the gift is already there. There are some of you who are master communicators even without training. It's a grace God gave you. Imagine what happens when you refine it, when you deploy it. There are, you don't know that charisma is a gift. The ability to compel the attention of people, to have a carriage that makes you desirable, is a gift. What have you ignored that God gave you while admiring others? It's good to admire what God has given others, but not to the detriment or at the detriment of what God has given you. Some of you here, you have never gone to a catering school. But what your fingers can do, even the angels, I mean, even not just men, they testify that these fingers, God has placed grace on them. Let me tell you this. One of the primary ways that God blesses men is through the works of their hands. I hope you know that. One of the primary ways that God blesses men is by blessing the works of their hands. The fruits of your mind, products of your creativity. I have met exceptional people. I remember one time I went to preach somewhere and some gentleman, did you know, I entered into the office, the rotunda, and while we were having a discussion, unknown to me, that gentleman was drawing me. True story. He was drawing me in an inverted way. I didn't even know it was me. Later on, they just called my attention. Then I turned around and here is a beautiful photo of me. I mean, you would think it's another me. And 
one of the graces God has given Africa and even this country is the gift. We are creative people, but we have not been trained to appreciate our own and what we have. Hallelujah. There are people who have constructed things here. Did you know I got to find out that there are people who have gotten international awards in this nation beyond 10, 11, 15, and yet nobody knows them. There are tech giants here. One time I was in Kenya, and then a group of gentlemen came, and there are some tech-savvy guys, a few of them, and they were just talking to me, and I was looking at them. I mean, just... If you see how these guys were brilliant, they knew what they were doing. All these guys who hack and steal money from banks and the rest, that is a grace God gave them that they perverted. The same energy it takes to steal is the same energy it takes to build. Are we together? Do you know what it means to stand on the road and time a car that is coming? It's the same principle of success. Why didn't they just convert it to build something that works? Every one of you under the sound of my voice, there is something God has placed in your hand. And that thing God has placed in your hand, among the many channels, is where your prosperity lies. Is where your increase lies. Is that true? There are people today who have become millionaires. Now, the purpose of identifying your giftings is not just for money, but I use that just to motivate you. They discovered something about themselves. Let me challenge you. I want you to take the time as an assignment. Identify three among the many giftings God has put in your life. Write them, be conscious of them. And then develop, refine them. If it means going to get an extra certification to give you credence to serve that gift, go for it. If it means having some informal training to build yourself, don't celebrate the, the existence of potentials. Identify them, but develop them until they are deployable. Nobody will pay you for identifying your potential in a raw state. It must be developed and then deployed to serve. Hallelujah. Some of you here have what it takes to start hairdressing outfits. You have it. It's a grace God gave you. You can be sleeping and still plat, and you will not make mistakes. Grace that God gave you, but you are there ignoring the gifting of God. Some of you can make clothes. Some of you can cook. Some of you, you just have the grace for leadership. You can train people. You can set up an educational outfit. It's a grace God gave you. 20 children, no more. And you put the fees there. Whoever has a trouble with their child understanding, they should come. By the time all those children produce A1 in their exams, you will not need to shout again. Now you can call the shots by yourself. Repent from laziness in the name of Jesus Christ. Many people just believe that they will emerge magically without identifying what God has given them. There are people today who sing. They raise their voices and my goodness, it's like you are hearing angels sing. Everything that needs to be done, there's a man empowered by God to be able to do it. Someone produced this, this Bible. Someone produced this phone. Someone produced this mic. What will the earth know you for? I want you to go back and make up your mind. Don't be marketing something you have not refined. Are we together? The moment you market a gifting that is not refined, you will be at the mercy of those you are trying to sell it to. But when you refine yourself, you can now define the terms because you are so gifted. Be so gifted that no amount of money becomes worth it to pay you. Did you hear what I said? Be so gifted, refine your giftings as a man of God, stay with the word, build capacity, such that no amount of money in gratitude anybody gives you looks like this is, no. You can celebrate God and say, thank God, but they know. That's what it means to be priceless. There are consultants today 
that people leave Nigeria or leave any other nation to go and meet them. There may be four or five in the whole world who do the things that they do. They were not born that way. They were children who identified an area of grace and pressed towards it. I am a, I am a fanatic of competence. I detest incompetence. Make up your mind that average, selling average will only leave you a mediocre. Challenge yourself by the spirit. You're a man of God. You make up your mind that in the name of Jesus, the son of the living God, I will not stand on anybody's pulpit and preach. And while I'm preaching, they are passing papers and say, please tell him to round up. Our people are angry because he's just preaching nonsense. And once you are done, they just say, okay, please, your car is at this other side, go. And they meet as a committee and say, never bring this person again. You see how all our destiny helpers are frowning now because this guy did not bring anything. Make up your mind that when this, the light in the stage is on for you, the moment you stand there, you don't stand on to shame. Do your homework. Labor in the spirit, in prayer. Acquire relevant knowledge. Acquire relevant trainings. Humble yourself and learn. If a child has what will promote and lift you and promote your mind and your understanding, humble yourself and let that child teach you. Hallelujah. I challenge our leaders here every time that we must continue to rise and to thrive. It is the same challenge for me as a man of God. I don't want to be at the same level. I don't want you to see me and it looks like I've plateaued at a level. No, it should be ever increasing glory. The Bible calls it the glory that excels. That when people see you at a level, at, by the next time they see you, you have, you have risen to an altitude in the spirit that is clear, evident before men. I'm praying for you. The kind of hunger that will not leave you a mediocre. The kind of hunger that will drive you to buy books. The kind of hunger that will drive you to watch videos. The kind of hunger that will drive you to get trainings. In the name of Jesus, may that hunger rest upon you. Can I tell you the truth? The cure for shame, among many other factors, is competence. The cure for shame, the cure for shame. Apostle, people seem to ignore me. Nobody seems to pay attention to me. Let me tell you the truth. Competence is your bailout. I vowed before God, and that not from a competitive standpoint, that there is nowhere I will stand on earth that I'll be ashamed. No. I will admire people, I will be inspired, I will be challenged, but never to a point that I will return and put my hand on my head as though I were not, no, no, no. Everybody was given one brain on earth, two eyes, two hands. If I am mismanaging my own, I should challenge myself to reinvent myself. God is speaking to someone. There are businesses that have been lying here and God is saying you better start doing something about it. There are creative ideas. Do you know some of you, you can be consultants. What you know with all humility, there are few people who know it the way you know it. What is stopping you from evolving? You can advise people. If I were not a preacher, I would still not be a failure. If all I do is to travel around the world teaching people how to live effectively, I will still be fulfilled doing it. Fixing people's minds and helping them to think well. Listen, the, this destiny race bar, if a door is closed, force it to open. Don't sit down there and say, who will open it for me? Force it to open. How forcible are right words. Hallelujah. You get to a place and it looks like there's nothing there. Father, you have placed something in my hand. What can I do? You gave me the ability to make hair. Uh, it's just making hair. Just making hair? Don't royalties make hair? Don't people make clothes? Why are you not the one doing their own? I have told you, you are only competent when kings invite you. And it's kings that really have the reward system you are looking for. Other people may just encourage you. The real reward comes when kings call you. Joseph interpreted three people's dreams. Remember? He interpreted the dream of the baker. They didn't have the power to reward him. 
He interpreted the dream of the wine presser. He didn't have the power to reward him. But when the king dreamt, and Joseph interpreted the king's dream, that was the end of hardship. It matters whose dream you are interpreting. God uses the baker and the wine presser to train you. Maybe you are a man of God here. Some of the small, small meetings God is giving you, don't worry, be faithful. He's training you. When he's done with you, one day he will sample your destiny helpers before you and give you an, a, an opportunity to articulate his grace upon your life. And that becomes the day there is no going back again. Do you believe what you are hearing? Koinonia, you are being trained to be a people of grace, a people of kingdom influence. This ministry does not raise mediocres by the grace of God. Did you hear what I said? Regardless where you are coming from, you come as you are, but you do not stay as you are. Kings are looking for you. They are calling you. And you see, when you become competent, nobody will ask you where you are coming from. All those questions are ways of managing you out of the scene. When a patient is about to die and a consultant comes, nobody will ask whether he's a male consultant, female consultant, young consultant. If that consultant is 29 years old, everybody will come and they'll say, Sir, my wife or my husband is about to die. Can you do something? Don't say people look at me like I'm a small boy. It's a lie. It's a lie. It's a flimsy excuse. Your competence can add to your age and keep you in the midst of elders and they will call you an elder accredited by competence i'm on my way to better days i'm on my way to better days that's your prophecy i'm on my way to better days it won't be like yesterday again you're on your way to better days Status is changing, there's no more decline. You're on your way to better days. Status is changing, no more decline. I'm on my way to better days. Apostle, I didn't have the opportunity to be born by rich parents. All I have is just the ability to sow when the hand of God rests upon that and you will now begin to sow for kings they will call you and say where did you learn this from and you will tell them it's by the hand of God I'm praying for someone you may be gifted but the anointing that needs to come on your gift to now start bringing you rewards I'm praying from this night let that anointing rest on your gift Shout a believers, amen. amen. Let the anointing rest upon your gift. Let the anointing rest upon your gift. What do you do when you find your gifting? Identify it, refine it, and serve. Identify it, refine it, and serve. One last time identify it refine it or develop it and serve you serve with it you serve with it you serve with it hallelujah every time you serve with the gifting god has given you there is someone at the end who is looking at you who needs you and will be willing to call you can i tell you this one of the prayers I want to pray for you before we touch the last one is if you are with the wrong audience, sometimes you can be gifted but you are in the midst of people who don't need what you carry. If you are in the midst of people who don't need what you carry, you will look weak. It, it will look like they are taking advantage of you. But when God wants to help you, he relocates you and brings you in the presence of people who have a desperate need for what you carry. That's when you will see how valuable you are. Can I pray for someone? By the anointing of the Holy Spirit, this night, I relocate you to the place where those who need you are. Listen, I remember 
I may not mention names, but I remember the very first meeting I attended where I can say they honored me sincerely and they honored me properly many years ago. Until then, of course, all those who did, they did their bid. I went for meetings as an anointed man. And sometimes, those days, it was usually the youth in the church who really wanted me to come and then they would pressure their pastors. So the people didn't have an appreciation for who was coming. It was just to honor the youth so that for some, so that they don't leave. Since they've said they want this man. And sometimes you come and with all due respect, not to look down those days. I'm sure the people were sincere. Sometimes they look with disdain. Sometimes they look with sarcasm. Who is this guy? Where is he from? Oh yeah, let's hear what he's saying. John 3, uh-huh, we're listening. Then later on, oh, this is serious. They are tapping them. Okay, looks like there's something here. Never forget a very touching story when I went to the house of someone to pray. I was invited. And I remember the man sat down with such sarcasm and he was looking at me. As if these are all these guys who are just these hungry people. And then when I began to speak, I noticed at a point the man stopped eating. True story. And he was looking. And then he started nodding in agreement. Lay down. That's it. Yes, that's it. At the end of it, he escorted me out. I pray for you again, my dear people. In the name of Jesus, may God position you where you are needed. Hallelujah. There are many business people here. Where you are, you are being underutilized. The people do not even know the value you carry. They push you like a piece of rag. Whereas there's somebody praying for half your potential and they will pay the person 10 times what they are paying you. Listen, it is when demand and supply meet that there are rewards. Are we together now? There are those who need you. They have been praying for you, but you have not been able to meet them. That's my own job now. Yours is to train your skill. My own is to relocate you by prophecy. And in the name of Jesus, I say it again. May my God send you as a gift. Send you as a gift. Send you as a gift. In the name of Jesus. I submit to you with every sense of humility. It is a beautiful feeling to be in the midst of those who have an appreciation for your value. They will honor you. They will do everything within their power. I have gone to places today where I was almost afraid at the treatment, the show of honor. I was almost with my, my conservative self. Please, let Jesus be the one who is seen. They say, that's your concern there. Jesus is already seen. Our own is to do this and you are wondering, how do you do such a thing for a human being? Again, I'm saying it all. Someone where you are walking, you are long overdue there. Long overdue. You have stayed there. The truth is with all humility, they don't have the capacity to reward your value again. Therefore, rise to the next level. Rise to the next level. If you have the faith to receive, there are some of you, your current level of development, you should be working with multinationals. You should be working with NGOs at an international scale. If you have the faith, I push you there by the Spirit. Something happened very recently that humbled me. And um, I'll save all the details, but God did something that I said, Kai, God, I fear you all. I fear you. I fear you. Once upon a time, there were people who I would pray from the sincerity of my heart to meet. It was my, in my sincere desire. It would be such an honor to meet some of these people with all due respect and with every sense of humility and glory to God. Some of these people today, they try to reach me and say, Apostle, do you know that I have tried for two years to get your number? The person who asked me to get, I had to be begging the person as if, and he finally gave me your number and I'm watching. And I said, my God, look at this. It's a dangerous thing to be where people cannot honor you. I'm saying this again. There are pastors, I want to pray for you. Not, not with any, there are certain people who God must bring 
to your congregation that are called sons of consolation these are people who God positions don't think what I'm saying is not important every man of God needs such people in their lives men and women sent by God with a revelation to hold your hands I'm not just saying it in terms of finances these are the kind of people if you cough they will buy you a pharmacy their assignment is to see that you remain you are their ministry by God ministry will be frustrating for you if you don't have such people God has stationed some of these people in my life to the glory of God I have seen many others have these people they make the burden of ministry easy they help you maintain integrity as you serve and you don't need to be a man of God to have these people by the privilege of God's grace there are families here the children you get birth to are not the only children God ordained to bless you there are other children that did not come from your womb but simply because you have not been located a young man can look at you and say mama because of something your daughter did for the rest of your life I will put you on salary till the day you see his face you don't believe that happens when Joseph was with his brothers what did they do they kicked him threw him inside a well Potiphar's wife added her own but the day Pharaoh saw him the first day became the only day he remained in that captivity when God wants to help a man even financially he blesses the works of your hands then he connects you to people who have entered their Rehoboth if you are Lot he will connect you to, I, to um, Abraham if you are Ruth he will connect you to Boaz if you are Esther he will connect you to Ahasuerus the pattern is always the same when God wants to accelerate your becoming he does not just bless the works of your hands he positions strategic people is it alright if I speak one more time in the name of Jesus Christ you are located in a place where your value is not appreciated whether you are a man of God whether you are a businessman if it's a period of your training may grace be given for you to remain there but if it is that your time is up and it's that your grace is being despised I relocate you to the place of honor you will hear marvelous testimonies from this marvelous testimonies do you know sometimes this my dear people sometimes they go to minister somewhere they will bless them and give them honorarium and then they will package something and say when you get back give apostle to Adam did I sing did I preach did I minister I don't even know the church where they went to hi may God extend people from you huh? extend people from you that will keep bringing back blessings to your life there are some of you someone will look at you and say so you are the mother of this lady because of that I'm moving you to a house of your own some of you someone will look at you and say so you are the one they've been talking about I move you to the if you believe it receive it in Jesus name please sit down let me give you the final one what can I do is the question that wise men ask if they desire to maximize destiny there is always something God puts in your hand you identify it you refine it you deploy it not just to give you money money is not the, the ultimate intent behind deploying your gifts being a blessing creating impact and rewards only become natural finally what is the final question where am I going when this life is over where am I going is a question of destiny even eternal destiny the wise do not stop in celebrating their giftings the wise do not stop in celebrating all of the things that they achieve here on the earth as much as we shouted amen and we celebrated all the things that God was giving us to excel the question where am I going is a very powerful question 1 Corinthians 15 19 
1 Corinthians 15, 19. Koinonia, let's read together. Ready? One to read. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. One more time. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. You know what this means? This means that as much as it is to achieve things, buying cars, buying houses, strategic achievements, all of these things are wonderful and they are part of the elements that help you to maximize life and destiny. But let me tell you the truth. One reality that all men must come to terms with is that eventually your time in the earth would come to an end either by his return or your exiting again let me finish the story i started with so that glorious morning i was in the city of worry preparing my notes for my session that morning when i got to see that the late dr miles had departed this earth and sadly it was in a plane crash i was quite devastated i asked a lot of questions now i know better haven't grown a lot more than i was then you can imagine 2014 and i thought to myself i said my god how brief life can be you only need to be alive for a few weeks to learn the vanity of acquiring everything here and not having an eternal consolation our world is full of people today who have passed on to glory it is in the matter of death that both the rich and the poor do not have any advantage against themselves and above themselves when it has to do with the issue of death and transition beyond this realm the rich is not greater than the poor the educated is not more advantageous than the uneducated male female young old death or transition as i would call it seems to be a very ruthless equalizer it can bring both the rich and the poor to their knees it can bring both the learned and the unlearned to their knees it brings whites and blacks to their knees it brings first world nations and third world nations to their knees you would think because of the abundance of resources people should not die you would think because of the vast extent of education, people should not die. You would think because of the excellency of achievements, people should not die. You would think because of the dexterity of people's health, they should not die. There are people who die today with no known medical cause. They just write something, but their health was impeccable and they still died. When it has to do with the matters of rounding up your life in the earth, Ladies and gentlemen, I want you to listen to this preacher. If all that we have only ends here, you do not have much. Thank God for certificates. Press for them. Thank God for secular achievements and achievements of any sort. Press for them. Build the business. Expand the ministry. But in all you're doing, have it at the back of your mind. Nobody has gone out of the earth with one dollar, one naira, one pound. It doesn't work that way. If you cannot carry your physical body out, talk less whatever, you know, is physical there. A quote from Dr. Miles Munro. Here's what he said. The richest place on earth is not the gold mines in Congo or South Africa or some part of Africa. It's not the oil mines in Nigeria and the Middle East. He said the wealthiest place on earth, he called it the symmetry. Why? Because books are lying there that were never written. Businesses covered with sand that never came to the light of day. Speeches that could alter the thinkings of generations. Like I have a dream. Imagine if he never said that. The press for justice and equality captured in an intelligent person's presentation has rewritten the liberation narrative of many, many territories today. What if these people never emerged? But my question is now that they are gone, what becomes of them? 
I hope you know that every secular celebration ends on earth. The parameter for celebrating people in heaven and the life beyond works by a separate set of rules. You would think that if you were a billionaire or you were a CEO or you were some man of God, by the time you stand before God, they would arrange you based on that rating. Chances are excellent that if I come into an occasion, perhaps for the purpose of honor, you would say, Apostle Joshua Selman, please, your seat is in front. It doesn't happen that way after this life is done. You will join a very ruthless queue where everybody stands and the works of men will be tried. Among the many things that I'm grateful to God for, for the mentorship of men like Dr. Miles Monroe, extending to that of people like Billy Graham, is the consciousness of eternity. That if only in this life, oh, this koinonia you see, we're not carrying it to heaven. It is a platform to help us serve the purposes of the kingdom whilst we are alive and within the time that is allotted. In this place right now, there are weak old babies. In this place right now, are children under 10. In this place right now, are teenagers listening to me. In this place right now, are young adults stepping into their early 20s. In this place right now, are adults maximizing their life. In this place right now, are people who have crossed the 50-year mark. In this place right now, are people who are rounding up their lives. Death is a strange equalizer. It can bring the entire achievements of a man to naught in one moment. By reason of what I do, when people die, usually people try to inform me either to pray for them, attempting to raise them back, or just to help manage the grief and all of that. You've heard me say these things again and again. Let me tell you the truth. If you've stood before many dead bodies, there is a sermon only a dead body can preach. That body has to be dead to preach that sermon. And I have listened to the sermons that have come from many dead bodies. Great bodies, but now dead bodies. Educated bodies, but now dead bodies. Warrior bodies, excellent in stature. Sickly bodies, healthy bodies that died. And all of them lie before life. The end of the achievement of all men is provided you are breathing. If you are not breathing, the story is over as far as this realm is concerned. The only thing you can transport out of this realm is one singular relationship backed up by your years of investment to the kingdom. These are the only things that sustain the power to have value beyond life. Dr. Miles taught us that in all our achievements, we should not be carried away by mundane things. We will build the houses. We will feed the poor. We will extend the influence to the farthest points as God grants grace. But in all that doing, we will not forget to remind ourselves and remind all those who are within our care. The Bible says in Acts chapter 20 and verse 28, it says, take heed to yourself first and then to the flock over which the Holy Ghost had made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. Take heed to yourself. I've preached it many times here. I won't die young by the grace of God, but I will never fear death. Never. It is unnecessary to fear death when Jesus is in your heart. It is unnecessary to fear death when you have found your place in life and you are spending your life serving him. For me, like Paul, I will emphasize again as I've done, to live is Christ and to die is gain. You don't run away from profit. The reason why we contend for longevity is not the fear of death. It is to allow us ample time to serve the purposes of the kingdom within the script allotted for us. Listen to me. If Christ tarries, a day will come. Nobody looking at me here will be in the earth. It will be another set of people. The same way there were other sets of people before our arrival. The wisdom here is that in all your getting degrees, in all your pressing to be an exceptional person, in all your passion to do ministry and excel in ministry, 
in all your passion to want to get financial resources as important as they are in all your desire to maximize destiny as we title this talk it is important for you to have it at the back of your mind that anything without Jesus only ends here the continuation of your relevance is directly connected to your being with Jesus and your receiving his life I have seen people die I know they were not saved it was a painful feeling because based on the authority of scripture the destiny of all sinners and all believers unbelievers is defined as painful as that may be maybe some of them were your loved ones today right now is an uncomfortable truth but if we are to judge by the integrity of scripture we know where they are and it is not a good place some of them left this morning some of them left last week some of them entered the new year we laughed together but they are gone today some of them laughed when we preached they mocked when we cried calling the name of Jesus they mocked to scorn as we rolled before the king of kings and for them destiny has folded someone came to church tonight and in the midst of all you have heard me teach you shouted amen for promotion you shouted amen for increase you shouted amen for prophetic relocation I hope you will shout amen when I mention Jesus I hope you will shout amen when I mention the wisest question that all men must ask and answer now listen you can delay in answering every other question I ask life will forgive you but there is one question that when you delay the consequence is eternal there are people who would discover and answer the question, who am I, when they are 40 or 50. It's not the best, but at least it's better than nothing. There are others who will answer the question, where am I coming from, late in life. There are others who will answer the question, why am I here, late in life. There are others who will answer the question, what do I have, late in life. Life will forgive you. Even Abraham. He started a major part of his journey from 75. Life forgave him. But can I tell you the truth? There is one question that if, even if you answer and you do not answer properly, both life and eternity will not forgive you. That is the question, where are you going from here? Hmm. You came to church because for some of you, you've answered all four, remaining the fifth. You have a healthy perception of yourself congratulations you know where you come from because you've hung around church you understand instinctively and by training why you are here you have a vast understanding of your potentials you've attended all kinds of leadership seminars and they have trained you into piecing together your value you can articulate them with uncanny mastery but the one question the Lord is asking you tonight and this wraps up my contemplation with us today and also in honor to the late Dr. Miles Munro where are you going? I'm not sure when Dr. Miles Munro said that he knew that he would soon be gone I'm not sure I never heard him say that he was going to go early even though I heard him say very confidently that even if he left early it didn't matter Little did he know he was prophesying and truly he left. All of us will not go the same day. Our times are in the hands of God. There are those who started this year. You know some of them. Today they've joined the cloud of witnesses and some painfully are in hell. My final call to you is that the greatest secret of your confidence in life should not be the cars that are parked in your garage not the amounts that are stashed in your account not the certificates that you have not the jewelries that are stashed in your box not the clothes that fill your room not the awards that decorate your office not the paraphernalia that life has brought around you the greatest basis of your confidence should be that in all of this if all I have is Jesus, I've got something more than gold. I will tell it to the world, 
Jesus is more than gold. I don't know how true it is, but I was told that one great giant of faith years ago when he left, they went to search his accounts and such other things, hoping that there would be so much money there. And I don't know. They didn't find as much as would be expected. And according to the story, the people were surprised. This man was so wealthy. We knew him to be wealthy while he served. What suddenly happened that he's long gone? He was told that the man would put a big table to eat and invite everybody and say, come and dine and eat. Honestly, let me tell you, don't wait till you are old before you understand the vanity of life without Christ. No certificate will replace your refusal of Jesus when life is done. No amount of white travel across the globe. You may be vast in learning, vast in travels. It will not replace your not knowing Jesus. Before we bow our heads to pray, I just felt to do this right now. And then we'll pray. On this Lord's day, the greatest way to maximize destiny, and I want you to write it, is to do destiny with Jesus in your heart. It is better to not have money and have Jesus. It's not the best, but at least it is better than the worst. You may never have the privilege of travel around the world. Perhaps not have the privilege to be celebrated by your world and your generation. But if you make this simple decision of making Jesus Lord of your life, and you mean it truthfully, then you have made the wisest decision. No other decision stands close to this. I want to extend an invitation to someone right now while we're all seated. You would do your destiny a great disservice to hear these kinds of teaching and answer amen with joy to all the four questions, excitedly so. And then for this one final one, which perhaps may be the only question you are yet to answer, you've answered the remaining four. It's time to answer the final one. You are saying, Apostle, this is the moment of destiny for me. I do not know how many days I have left. All I know is that I want to live my life loving Jesus, serving Jesus, living for Him, spending my life for Him. You are in this place and you are saying, I have never consciously made a decision for Jesus. I've been to crusades where men of God preached. I've read books on salvation, perhaps you may be saying. I have watched on TV salvation messages, but I've never really taken a conscious step to sort my eternal destiny and my eternal stand. Tomorrow may be late. It is true. Jesus is giving you an opportunity right now. And you are saying, Apostle, I know that the times are evil. I want to redeem the time. I want to stop wasting my life living anyhow. You are in this place. You are rededicating your life to Jesus or making a first call wherever you are I want you to stand up right now and come and stand right before me don't be ashamed and don't be afraid don't wait for anyone to come before you leave your seat with the boldness and the confidence of one who is determined to maximize destiny come Koinonia let's celebrate them as they come come Please stand. Let me request that you stand so there will be space. Please come. Jesus gathered us today even for your sake. Come. Oh glorious one. We praise your name. We lay our crown. Are you coming? If you're coming, please come quickly.
you're joining us from across the globe, I want you to follow in this prayer. If you're joining them, please come quickly. It's never too late to make it right with Jesus. Thank you, brothers and sisters, for this noble decision. Many made this decision, and today they are eternally grateful for it. Many despise the call for this decision, and unfortunately, there may not be a chance again, based on what the Bible says. For you, you have hearkened to this call. The Bible says, as many who will come to him, he will in no wise despise. I salute your courage. Please lift your right hand. And I want you to say this after me as loud and as clear as you can. Say, Lord Jesus. Say one more time, Lord Jesus. Tonight, I have heard your word. I declare that I love you with all my heart. I declare that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for my sin. I believe that you rose again for my justification. Right now, I receive Jesus into my heart as my Savior, my Lord, and my King. I declare that the power of sin, Satan, hell, and the grave is broken over my life. From tonight, I am a child of God. I go forward ever and backward never. Amen. Keep your hands lifted. Lord, we thank you eternally grateful for the privilege to extend your life, your love, your message to these precious ones and the many who have made this call across the globe. Your word declares that as many who will come to you, you will in no wise cast away. We thank you for receiving these ones and imparting upon them the life of God. I pray by the authority of scripture that the grace to live victorious Christian lives is imparted upon them right now. That they will love you like never before. They will serve you like never before. I pray for you all that you will go from glory to glory and grace to grace. And that when this life is over, together we will rejoice in the presence of our King and Savior. In the mighty and matchless name of Jesus. Amen and amen.